This program for and welcome to this afternoon's Sunset Safari where we have just just caught up with the little chief himself who seems to be after something that he's oh no he's just after a different shady spot. A very good afternoon to you. My name is Jamie and this afternoon Craig is on camera with me and we're live from Juma Private Game Reserve which is in the Greater Kruger National Park area of South Africa. Now because this is a live safari first of all when we start our safaris the animals do this to us as a part of Cole's law but also at the same time you can send through your questions and you can do that on hashtag safari live on twitter alternatively you can send them through in the comments section of youtube right craig well we're going to have to move are we not hey little boy what are you doing what are you doing a bit of an odd mood this afternoon now it is quite warm as I'm sure you're going to be told repeatedly by all three of us who are out this afternoon. It is, a person's told me three times what it is. It's 37 and, 37 and 90 something. Something like that. It's hot. It's hot and it's sweaty. 98. I'm sorry, Kirst. I know you did tell me three times, but I forgot. I don't know why he's chosen to lie there, but I think it's because this, the ground is nice and wet. So I said that it's hot. Hosanna this morning, for those of you who missed it, had a somewhat, I suppose, rotten impala carcass that he was nibbling on, and he took a little bit of it down here into the drainage line behind the dam wall. It's the perfect spot to come on a hot afternoon, but it does mean that there's no breeze. So it's all fine and well being down here in the shade, but there's actually nothing to keep you cool or to keep the flies away. And I think that's why Hassan has gone to lie where he has. I think his patch where he was initially has got quite warm and he's decided upon our arrival. I think we just provided the final layer of motivation necessary to get up, move, and then to curl up down there underneath that pile of logs and make our lives very difficult. It is hotter down here, Hosanna. I don't know whether you realize this, but it's definitely hotter down here than it is up there. There's no breeze at all. But because this is an overflow or a drainage line, we're actually in a riverbed, it, there's still quite a lot of dampness to the soil. So that's probably why he is where he is. I'm almost tempted to go join him. Obviously not right there. Now this morning we found him on foot. Unfortunately, due to an attack of the gremlins, we didn't manage to get him live on foot. But we went down. Herbie was busy looking at the monkeys and I was trying to tell him that Hosanna was, was right at his feet, basically, looking at us. So we, we did find him on foot this morning. It's very nice. I always enjoy spending time with a special leopard on foot because he is so relaxed with us. Hey, my boy. You beautifully framed. Child of the Universe wants to know that why Hosanna doesn't go take a dip in the water. It's, a, it's an interesting one. I could tell you straight up that lions and leopards don't particularly like to wallow in water. They don't like having wet fur. They've got quite thick fur. What's up, boy? He's not quite, I don't know, something odd about him today. And normally he'd have passed out already. Maybe he is just so, so hot he can't. So I could tell you that lions and leopards don't like it. Uh, he could find himself a puddle to wallow in, but you never see leopards doing that. However, having said you never see leopards doing that, or lions, I know that Scotty in the Masai Mara a few months ago had this amazing sighting of lions wallowing which you never get to hear about or read about or even really see pictures of. And there's no reason why they shouldn't in, at some point be a leopard that doesn't read the books that decides it actually likes water. But generally speaking, even on the hottest of the hot days, leopards will not go and lie in water. Now, obviously we're right next to the dam. There is no way that Hosanna would go and lie in there. And there's a very good reason for that. It is because he, there's crocodiles, quite frankly and quite simply. It's too big of a risk. 
Now, I'm not the only person out on this gloriously hot afternoon, sweating our way through it. <laughs> Sydney is out. Let's go and see how he feels about this heat. A very, very good afternoon and most of all, welcome to the beginning of the afternoon game drive. This is Sydney Fumurani Mikosi and I'm traveling with Senzo, who is my camera operator this afternoon. Hopefully, we are going to get to see quite a lot of interesting animals. I don't have a specific target this afternoon. I will be looking for a general game. Hopefully, we are going to see a lot. So the weather is so hot at the moment. I'm sure this kind of weather will be restricting quite a lot of movement on these animals this afternoon. <laughs> hello, hello. And for in case if you would like to talk to us, you can follow us on Twitter, hashtag Safari Live. You can also follow us on YouTube chat stream. So the grass is growing very quickly here after the heavy rains. I can see that the predators can easily get camouflaged. It's green everywhere. This bush looks very impressive. It's beautiful here. I have been away just for about a couple of days, but now I am seeing quite a lot of changes at the moment. So now let's um, cross over to Tristan, who's got the beautiful hippopotamus. Indeed, we are out and about as well, and you can see that we're sitting with the animals that have the exact right idea in afternoon heat like we've got this afternoon. It's not as bad as yesterday, but it's still quite warm. Um, and so you'll find these guys are going to position themselves just inside Biffelzook Dam and enjoy a spot of bathing. Of course, it's Scuba Steve and Snorkel Sarah um, that we are talking about. Brent gets very angry because we call them Scuba Steve and Snorkel Sarah and we don't actually check if it's the same hippos. But anyway, mm -hmm. he's not here anymore, so he can't shout at us. My name is Tristan on camera. I've got Sebastian this afternoon and it is a very warm welcome to all of you. Hopefully you will enjoy having us out and about with you during the course of today. The kind of plan for this afternoon for us is to head towards Torchwood. We had Tingana and Tlalumba there this morning, and so we're going to try and see if we can find them again. Unfortunately, both of them were quite mobile, and Tlalumba got a fright when she saw Tingana from afar and ran, and so it's going to be a bit tricky to find them, but hopefully they'll be on, one of them will be on a mound somewhere with a bit of shade, and we'll get lucky. So that's the kind of plan for the afternoon. Um, we also did have wild dogs this morning, for those of you that think we, well, well, wondering why they weren't on the show. Well, we were out on tracking team, um, and so we were just trying to find some stuff, and, and we found, obviously, the dogs, and they ran into Chitwa before the show. We, we could get Juma back online, and then, obviously, Tingana and Tlalamba, we found them, I think, with about two minutes to go in the show, and they were quite far to the east, and it's going to be a bit tricky with signal and the likes, but we'll try our best to see if we can find them on that side of the world. But you can see these hippos are very, very sleepy. Scuba Steve? You tired, boy. Must be a happy hippo, though, now that his dam has got water once again and that he is able to kind of sit and take it very, very easy and enjoy a bit of water. And you'll see there's a little ox picker um, that's on the back that's quite hot. You can see how it's got its mouth open and is basically practicing gula flutter, which is equivalent of a cat cat or a dog panting. Marcel, how long do hippos live for? Well, generally in the wild, you'll find that hippos will live to about 30 years. Um, they can go a little bit older than that, um, but it's, you know, in wild, given that they fight with one another, there's predators, those kind of things, generally the lifespan is a little bit shorter. But look at that oxpecker. You see how it's opening one of the wounds on the hippo's back? Because that's why it's trying to cause a bit of bleeding to start, so that it can actually drink the blood and get that. So it's not actually looking for any parasite. It's trying to actually get some blood flow going in that little wound that is on the back but it doesn't seem like any blood is actually coming out at this stage so yeah back to the kind of age thing is that these guys obviously in the wild there's a lot of different factors whereas in captivity they would be able to be fed they would have vet um, care they would you know have no worries about predation and so they can go to about 35 in in captivity but 30 generally in the wild would be quite an old hippo so i mean there are one or two probably get to 35 but not that often now, i'm sure this hippo wants to go in the water completely to stop 
stop the oxpecker pecking at any wounds, but hasn't quite rolled over just yet. You can see the one next to it is sort of kind of canted to the side. So sometimes when they get a little bit kind of dry on one spot, they'll just canter left or right, and that will allow them to keep their body nice and covered and really kind of cool down and, and to stop too much dehydration. But quite cool little oxpecker right between his head. Best of friends, really, at this stage or he's just too lazy to care about the oxpeck. You can see a little flick of the ears, so that will be just to get um, water out of the, the ears itself. Often when they go underwater, there's a little bit of extra moisture that collects once the ear is turned and sealed, and then they just flick that out to make sure that the water doesn't go in and cause any issues inside there. So quite a little clever system. And you find the oxpecker sometimes will try and kind of go towards the ears to try and look for parasites, and then they flick them too just to try and stop it. But this oxpecker is really going to town on these hippos' hides. Unfortunately, they're getting rather hammered. You see that poor oxpecker must be so hot. The fact that it's got its mouth open like that after every kind of peck gives you an idea of how warm it is. I mean, we're close to 100 degrees Fahrenheit again today. Um, and so in, that, in the sun like that, it's going to be very, very hot. So Tommy said the oxpecker looks like it's actually laughing about it. Well, I suppose so. A bit of, you could imagine it having that sinister evil laugh as it pecks and breaks open the skin. Maybe that's how it's laughing. I don't know. We'd have to kind of think of an oxpecker laugh. Would it be deep and sinister or would it be high-pitched and squeaky that would make it quite funny? I'm not quite sure yeah, as to which kind of laugh a oxpecker would have. I reckon if they're picking it away at scars and so Kirsty reckons it would be ha 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 ha. So that's a little kind of laugh. I reckon you're probably quite spot on, Kirst. They I mean they don't have exactly have a high pitched call at the best of times. Hippo <laughs> is falling asleep underwater, but they don't have a high pitched call at the best of times and so you know, I reckon that's probably about right. Good, we're getting absolutely baked in the sun here, so we're gonna try to carry on and get a bit of airflow before we catch a heat stroke. Uh, it's very, very hot, and unlike the hippos, we are not wallowing in water, and so we're going to just try and kind of move and see if we can find some semblance of shade. Scuba Steve, you have a good day there, buddy. Enjoy your nap. Hopefully, we'll see you out and about a little bit later. Good. We're going to keep heading off towards Torchwood. In the meantime, though, let's send you up to the Masai Mara so that Mr. Hendry can say good afternoon to all of you. Now, this is very interesting, everybody. Good afternoon. Before I give you all the greeting and the housekeeping, look at that. There is an elephant and there's an egret standing on its back. I've never seen that before. Now, often we're asked why it is that oxpeckers don't sit on elephants and well sometimes we say they just don't tolerate them we know that elephants of course are very thick skin and so they probably don't have anything like the number of external parasites that something like an impala or buffalo or rhino might have but the answer that elephants just don't tolerate birds is very clearly shown to be false here isn't that interesting? Good afternoon and welcome to the Masai Mara. My name is James Henry. It's marvellous to have you with us here for the next two hours on our Sunday afternoon drive. I don't know why I like to say Sunday afternoon like that, but I do. And so I shall. Uh, please talk to us, of course, using the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter and the YouTube chat stream. We are in the territory of the Sausage Tree Pride. We did see them lying under a tree about hmm, 20 minutes ago now. We came to look and see if we could find the males and whatever else was going on around here. And if we get very lucky, we might find the males, but we'll probably go back to the sausages very shortly. So that is the state of play down south here with the Sausage Tree Pride and the elephants. Of course, we have our TV show a little bit later. If you'd like to watch us, you can join us on SABC3 if you're in South Africa. Otherwise, you might be able to catch it on YouTube. Lots of beautiful egrets. All right, shall we drive along? I must, of course, tell you that uh, the inimitable Peter Bungay is on camera. He has got all five fingers attached to his left hand. Let us continue. Let's go around and have another look at these elephants because the lions weren't far from here earlier. 
Anna, there is a fire to the left. We were told yesterday that perhaps people were harvesting bees. Well, not harvesting bees, harvesting honey. I'm not sure that that's what's going on there, though. Maybe. There might be. We'll have another look. We'll get a little bit closer. I just want to go and check at the buffalo carcass from yesterday as well before we go back to the pride. The males might just be lounging there. That's not far from where we are now. There's a lovely picture of those elephants and those egrets. So we'll just try and get a little bit closer to them, I think. Ah, I see now where that other vehicle disappeared to, chaps. It went round to where we had the buffalo and the sausage tree pride yesterday. Let's drive along through here. It is a beautiful, beautiful afternoon out. We've got about, I'm going to say, an hour and a half left of light, which is just delightful. Soft. Mara light and Mara colours. And it's been quite a nice hot day, which means that if there are lions about, you can almost be guaranteed that they'll be lying under one of the, uh, shall we say, thinly dispersed trees. Let's have a look there. At the elephants, and the mountain, and the bee harvesters or honey harvesters. I can imagine by my saying that there are honey harvesters there, there are probably people at home thinking to themselves, how could they? Don't they know that bees are endangered? How could they treat them like that? I think you'll probably find the bees will go back to their original spot there. I also think you'll find that the amount of bee harvesting that goes on here or honey harvesting that goes on probably affects the bee population very little indeed. Much less, for example, than the perhaps even the farming of avocados. Davy, we dealed with wildfires in Africa in the following manner. Um, we have a traditional <coughs> fire dance, and once we've completed the dance, we run away screaming like this. Davy, put the camera on me, I'll show you. We go like this, and then we run really fast, and that tends to help us to get away from the wildfires here in Africa. Obviously, that's not really true. Uh, we deal with them in much the same way as you do anywhere else in the world, uh, with uh, helicopters dropping water on them, with uh, back burns. So at a place like Juma, or in an area like this, what you'll do is set a back burn. In other words, you'll start to burn a piece of ground towards the fire against the wind, because obviously fire moves with the wind. And you have to do that very carefully with a big team of people. It's quite a skilled job and it's quite a scary job because the fire can jump behind you and then you can get yourself into real trouble. That's generally how we do it. Often you can just let them burn out. They're, you know, because they need three things. They need fuel, they need... Uh, dry atmosphere and they need uh, heat so they've they've got to have those three things in order to um, in order to to burn effectively you'll find that as night falls in a lot of these grassland areas the fires will die down and they're actually quite easy to put out once the temperature drops and if there isn't too much wind it is very different however in areas where you have aromatic or oily trees if you know what i mean and so it's a wildfire rushing through the Mara is nothing like a wildfire rushing through uh, California, through the trees there, or through some of those Australian gum trees. Uh, those are far more dangerous than any fires that we have here because the trees, you know, obviously explode into, into fire. I'm going to continue with my fire discussion once we've looked at these elephants. The one behind does not look particularly happy. I don't know why that should be the case. I mean, we're a long way from her. Beautiful with all the egrets, isn't it lovely? So we're not going to get any closer, we're just going to let her be. I'm not sure why she's marching her crew closer to <coughs> us, that seems a bit odd. Well, 
Are you getting comms there, Bunge? Yes. What is she saying? I'm getting nothing. I just got the last. And you just get blip? Yeah. Yeah, I will go. I only got blip as well. Anyway, while the elephants have calmed down, there are some parts of South Africa where obviously we do have much more dangerous wildfires. And in fact, down in the Eastern Cape and Western Cape of South Africa, there are currently tremendously dangerous wildfires. My uncle nearly lost his home uh, yesterday to wildfires in, in the Hermanus region, and that burns in the Feinbos area. So those are very oily uh, plants that sort of explode to fire <coughs> and carry fire, much like the trees in a place like California or in... Um, in Australia would. So in an area like this, yes, we do get wildfires, deal with them either by letting them burn out or putting in back burns. All right, so that's my fire discussion. Let's go back across to South Africa where Jamie Patterson is with the star. <laughs> it sounds like a stunning sighting with Jabes in the Mara. There's nothing like spending time with elephants across that side. As for this crazy cat, I don't know what his deal is. He was sitting curled up quite comfortably behind the logs. Then he decided to come and lie down right in front of our vehicle, where not even the camera could actually see him. So then I moved back a little bit, just to put some space between myself and him, because I can't see what he's doing down there. And obviously we can't spend our afternoon talking about the front part of my vehicle. So I moved back and I stopped and I switched off and then you know what this silly, silly creature did? He did it again. He got up and he walked to us and he lay down in front of, right in front of the vehicle. I mean, basically lying up against it. And I don't know why, because surely it's hot. I mean, the vehicle's been running for not very long, but still enough to produce heat. I can feel the heat coming up through the bottom of the car, the base of the car. So why on earth did he decide that that was where he wanted to be? Hey, silly cat. I thought maybe it was because I'd accidentally missed his... He maybe moved his meat here and I'd missed it and I'd driven over it. Oh, maybe I did. No, he's... No, he's not. He just wants to be where I was parked. I think maybe our vehicle tires flattened the grass there or something. I don't know. You weirdo, boy. You absolute weirdo. Maybe it's just the best spot. Sir Reads A Lot, a very warm welcome. Sir Reads A Lot is a name I have not heard before, which means that we are greeting, as far as we know, a new viewer. Now, Sir Reads A Lot wants to know, am I not scared of being this close to a big cat? Every single animal that we see out here is wild and should be treated as such. That means a degree of respect, constantly reading their behavior. That's why we do what we do is because we've spent many years doing so. Having said that, these cats are perfectly relaxed with the presence of safari vehicles. They've grown up with safari vehicles. This particular young leopard, who if you continue to watch, which you will, because you're going to become addicted, um, this particular cat we've watched grow up since he was a few hours old, which is really very special. So he's had safari vehicles as part of his environment since he was little, and it has allowed us a totally unparalleled insight into his life. So he does not see us as food. We don't look like food. There are a lot of people who will tell you that animals cannot identify individual people when they are in a vehicle. I'm not convinced by that. I think that they know that we're here. Obviously, we're talking. They can see us. I mean, if they can pick out an individual impala, they can pick out a person sitting on a car. But they don't associate us with, as a threat, and they do not associate us with food. So that combination means that as long as they are not afraid of us, we are perfectly safe where we are. But we always treat the animals carefully, and we make sure that we're constantly watching their behavior. This is exciting news, something that wants to stay well away from Hosanna, but that I've been looking forward to seeing at this time of year. Tristan's found one. Go have a look. Indeed, and rightly so, should stay well away from Hosanna because we know Hosanna grabbed one of these last week. But it's not that that we are worried about. You can see that's a big adult kudu female that is not pregnant in any way and so Hosanna wouldn't target that in particular but there's a tiny little baby moving around in amongst those two adults tricky to see but it's behind that one I think let's see if it will move I can just see a bit of movement 
behind that one. It's so small that it's completely hidden by these adults and seems to be a little bit shy of us at this stage. I don't know why. Obviously, well, I actually do know why. I mean, I suppose we're a big object. It's a bit kind of nervous as to what we are and what we do. And so it will be trying to stay close to mom. There you go. See the little head? Hello, little one. Look at its ears. It's so much bigger than the rest of its head. And that is a very new baby. Probably within, I would say, the last few days. You can see, look how it's smelling us and trying to listen to us. It's probably thinking to itself, Mom, what is this? It's so big. I don't know. Is it something that I must run away from? Must I stay still? But of course, if Mom is staying still and, and kind of just watching us, then it will be okay. But it is absolutely tiny. You can see it doesn't even go past Mom's tail yet. So... I believe a lot of you are ooing and aahing at the cuteness of this little baby kudu. They are really cute. I like baby kudu because they, everything just looks too big for their head. You know, those ears are ridiculous um, in comparison to the size of their head. And then on top of that, they have long legs that they kind of bound around with. Gina, you say its little lips are so cute. Yes, kudu have that little white marking on their lips. And so it can be quite cute, particularly in the little babies. You'll often kind of see this little cute kind of face looking at you and I just love how the little nostril is flaring as well trying to just work out what exactly we are and whether or not she needs to be worried I don't know if it's a boy or a girl yet actually to be honest we just kind of have seen this little tiny head popping up near mom but so cool to see uh, baby animals are very cute things there's no doubt about it there's most animals that you see um, when they're young are very very cute of course it does need to be careful that little one because obviously out here there's a lot of predators um, that will be around and, and like Jamie rightly said Hosanna would be very eager to grab that little one so would wild dogs so would Tandi, Tingana, pretty much anything really that's a predator archer, even hyenas would like to go after a small kudu like that and they do target them quite often. Um, you find a lot of young kudu of that size being eaten, particularly by wild dogs, they, they tend to grab them quite regularly. They can kind of cause panic and get hold of these little ones. But you can see how it's staying close to mom while we're here just to make sure everything's okay. You might go for a little drink of milk. There we go. Are you wanting to suck a little one? No, we're too interesting. We need to see, investigate us a little bit more. Isn't that cute? Shame. You can see mom in the background, how much she's heavy she's breathing because she must be um, incredibly warm at the moment. You can see like that rocking back and forth motion. That's all just much like any of the other animals trying to cool down. She, her rate of breathing is much faster. Now, giraffe girl, how long will a little kudu like this nurse for? Well, you normally see them kind of nursing like this for about the first three months and then they start to really kind of concentrate more on vegetation. Some of them will be quite cheeky and will try a little bit longer. <laughs> Look, it's sniffing the little tail. Hello, mom. Now it'll just follow along right next to it and you can see the size difference there. It can even fit underneath its mother completely. So you can see it's standing between mom's legs at the moment, which is very, very cute. Um, so normally about three months and then they start to kind of go more into grass. Some of them will be a bit cheeky and they'll try to go a little bit longer than that um, and try and bully their moms into suckling more. Um, but just theoretically, they should be going on to leaves already at around sort of even earlier than that. Some of them at sort of a two months can already start feeding on a bit of vegetation, but they will try and suckle and try and get as much milk out of mom for as long as possible. And any baby animal really is like that. Now, where are you off to little one? Are you going to go exploring? Must be very careful about doing this. So that's one thing about little baby kudu. If they separate like that from their mother, this is where a leopard would really want to be um, around because it would be able to get to that kudu before mom could protect it, and that would be dangerous. Now it's going to go and almost looks like it wants to investigate a male impala that's across the road. So Sky, who's eight years old, there you go, there's a nice size comparison between the little baby Kudu and the Impala male. Um, why do they have stripes on their body? Well, the simple reason for that Sky is because most of their time is spent in thick, dense areas. Now, if you look where it's standing there, do you see that there's a bit of shade and then there's a bit of light on the leaves? And so when a Kudu is behind a few trees, that white marking that you see there helps to break up the outline of this kudu. So what that means is it basically makes it very difficult to see the exact shape of the kudu in those little sort of areas 
where there's light and dark, and it helps the kudu to camouflage more, which means it hides away better from predators, and it makes it easier for these guys to then kind of be able to fool predators into thinking that they're not there. So that's basically why they've got it, is all just part of camouflage and to help them stay as hidden as possible. You can see it's just on the edge of the road now. Quite cool, actually, to see. I think it's quite curious about this impala male. Is the umbilical cord still attached, Chris? That's quite cool work. It's very really difficult on these little monitors to see much. But yes, there it is. It's drying up a little bit. So like I say, only a few days old, I would imagine, this little one. Um, that umbilical cord is starting to dry now, so should be okay. But look, it's sniffing around. Imagine what it must be like for this little one. Everything smells. Everything is new. Um, it's just all about investigating and trying to figure out its world. Now, Mom looks very impressed with that. She's kind of quite proud of her little one at this stage. She's kind of standing over it and having a little look and there's the kind of size difference between the two and you can see how much bigger the females are and why it was such an impressive kill that Hosanna made um I mean that could you there is probably almost I would say two to two and a half times the size of what Hosanna is and so for him to bring that down plus a fetus that was inside that female is quite something but anyway, we're going to kind of carry on and see what else we can find. And something that has also got immense strength, like Hosanna, is a little, little insect that Sydney has. <laughs> something is happening here. The duck beetles are so fascinating. I've been here for the past few minutes and a lot of things has been happening. I just want to get off here so that we can have a nice discussion about these majestic and beautiful insects. <laughs> Look, there's a very big fight taking place here. Look, how many, about four of them are involved on a fight. Look at this here. <laughs> So we have seen quite a lot of balls already, which has been taken out. Different ones, big ones. So there's quite a lot of competition going on. Look, another one is now about to leave the, the, the dung pile. So listen to that. You can hear them when they're fighting, when they're pushing each other. You can hear some rattling sound. This is amazing. Look, there's one, two, three, four. There's quite a lot of big balls still here. So, but I want to first see which droppings are these from. So I can see that here on the ground, there's evidence such as this. This is the Amarula fruit. It's clear that this is the elephant dropping. So, but this, I don't think is fair enough to call them droppings at this stage because these insects are feeding. <laughs> so now it's food. This is food. <laughs> it's food for the dung beetles. It's no longer droppings. Let's rather call them droppings when they are unattended. Now when other animals are feeding, this is food. <laughs> so let me smell this food. Mm. The dung beetle boss, they don't smell bad. So it's just like uh, the normal elephant uh, drooping smell. So here, these dung beetles are assisting a lot. If you can check, there's quite a lot of flies here. You can see, look at this. There is too much flies here. There's these flies, some of them are laying some eggs here at the moment. And when they're laying eggs, dung beetles at the same time, they are rolling the balls and destroying the eggs at the same time. So they are helping us in order to control the population of flies. Naturally, dung beetles are there in order to control the balance when it comes to the population of flies. So this is very much interesting. After this, they are, some of them are going deep this side, some are going down on this road. So they are going to find a nice spot and bury these kind of balls. So dung beetles, when talking in terms of the strength, the dung beetles, they are very much strong. Yes, the strongest animal in the whole world is the elephant. But when talking in terms of the strength to weight ratio, dung beetle is the best. So they're all looking very much dirty. And oh, there's even a kennel here. Look at this. Oh, here, we might see a fight there because I can see it's three. You see, <laughs> it's going back again. Look at that. Look at that. Look at that. Now, now it's a fight. Look at that. This is amazing. <laughs> when you see that is three, you must know that <laughs> that one is lost. This one is running away now with the, with the droppings. <laughs> now they are fighting again for nothing. Look at that. 
So the other one is trying to escape, and there's still a fight. This one is still looking for that one with the ball. You can see. So let's see. Maybe he's going to manage to find this one with the ball here. Then we might see another fight. Look, it's coming towards that direction. Look at that. The fight is, is going to carry on again. Look at that. <laughs> I don't know whose dropping is this, but I can see that here there is something interesting. So this one is driving over his wife now because the, <laughs> the wife is, is the one which is holding. So he doesn't care now. All he wants to get the ball and the wife away. Then he's rolling, driving over the wife. This dang beetle is careless. <laughs> So look at the, oh, now he's fighting that one. Look at that. Oh, this is amazing. Now he's driving the ball much more this side. Maybe there was just a little bit of disagreements uh, between the husband and the wife because the husband is the one normally who pushes the wife is having a lift. So after this, you will see the little ones inside they are going to be able to eat because when they're hiding, when the eggs hatch is dung beetles, they've got a complete life cycle. So when they hatch the eggs, little ones, they have to be able, the larva must be able to eat by the fresh parts of these droppings. And these larvas, when they are still going through the larva stage, they also experience problems because some of the animals, such as the honey badgers, they like to dig the they, 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 they like to dig these dung ball, balls and crack them in order to eat the lava. So that is something which is also controls the population of dung beetles. So you can see now there's a lot of big balls coming out again. Look at that. I can see another one is, is, is coming out now. It's taken uh, through that side. So that is quite a very big ball. <laughs> Paul, they can't be able to hurt each other. I have seen some of the dung beetles, they have got short limbs. Some of them has got broken legs here because of uh, invo involving themselves in this kind of uh, fight. And apart from this, there are some of also other animals who predate the dung beetles. There's birds who eat them. And they've got a very strong chitinous uh, cover, which is very hard. Some of them, they land on their back when they come to these droppings. So they, their skin is very much hard. So you can see the elephants, the reason why they... Look, another one is landing. Oh, it just landed now. Carol, from what I have seen here today, I, I, I have noticed that there is a difference because all these who are just climbing, they are very much clean. And the ones who are pushing are looking very dirty all the time. If you can check here, the females are not doing anything. So the easiest way for me to distinguish between the male and female is to check. The one who's got dirty wings is the male I'm seeing here. And the females, their bodies are looking very shiny. So the female's body are shining and the male's bodies, they are looking much more dirty and much more brown. Uh, this is one of the uh, best sightings. <laughs> so the elephants are the ones who are giving these dung beetles quite a lot of nutritious food at the moment. So let's quickly cross over to James and see if those elephants are not excreting food for the dung beetles. Right, everybody, we've been spending a very interesting time here while you've been having a very interesting time with the warring beetles of dung. And what's interesting here is that an elephant died yesterday around here. We met some rangers who told us that. We came back into this area to see what was going to happen if perhaps it would be surrounded by a fight between the border pride and the sausage tree pride as they decided who was going to have the spoils. Instead, what we came across was a big pile of soil. So the rangers buried the elephant that died here yesterday. Uh, we don't know why yet. I'll phone David and try and find out. I suspect they probably were worried that it may have died of some disease and instead of risking, you know, the prey out here, they just thought, well, let's put it in the ground just to be safe. Now, it is entirely possible uh, and by the way, it definitely wasn't a poached elephant, so it did die of natural causes, but I think they were probably maybe worried that it had a disease. What's interesting here is that that elephant that you're looking at there with a long tusk, she's got a shorter tusk on the left-hand side, has been very unhappy with us. 
And we initially, she was the one that you initially saw lifting her head at us, towards us, and displaying this pleasure at our presence, despite the fact that we have never been closer than 100 meters to her. So, you know, we really haven't been pushing her. It's not like she's cornered in any way. She just took exception to our presence. And we moved back a bit, and she got a little bit more irritated, and so we moved back further, and then she calmed down, and then one or two others of the herd shook their heads at us. And we think maybe that the elephant not far from here is perhaps a relative of these ones, and that these elephants, not to put too fine a point on it, have basically been at a funeral. Now, I know that that might sound ridiculous to many of you. Many of you will go, oh, yes, of course, that's obvious. We know elephants mourn. Um, some of you may say, well, there's no real evidence of that. How do you prove that an elephant mourns? Well, the answer is you can't, really. I don't think I've seen or heard about an experiment that you can prove uh, or that has shown without doubt that elephants mourn. But anybody who's ever owned a dog knows when that dog is sad or when that dog is happy. It's, you know, there's no question that those dogs can feel emotion. We know elephants are hugely intelligent. We know that they have a very high brain to body mass ratio or brain volume to body mass ratio. We know that they're highly social, and there is a lot of anecdotal evidence to suggest that they really do get very upset when some of their own die. So maybe it's perhaps uh, the old matriarch of this herd that died here yesterday, and they're all just a bit tense and upset and sad by the whole thing. That was our guest here on the vehicle. Isaac is on the vehicle too, so we were having a long chat about it. Oh, no, Blue Monkey Pig, that couldn't be why that herd was running away yesterday morning. I remember that. No, that was miles away. That was up north. We were way down south near the Tanzanian border at the moment in the Sausage Tree Pri in the Sausage Republic, as David likes to call it. Um, yesterday's event took place right near the Ololola Gate, the completely other end of the reserve. So, no, it definitely didn't have anything to do with uh, what's going on here. Anyway, I'm not going to push these elephants any further. I mean, not that we have pushed them, but we're going to veer away from them now and head down towards the sausages once we've finished with the sighting. I just love the egrets that are flying in amongst the grass. Great clouds of white egrets. Those are cattle egrets, and they're obviously just looking for insects and that sort of thing. Now, apparently, the great epic war of the dung beetles is ongoing, so I think we're going to send you back there. I am still here witnessing this very great war at the moment, and I'm going to go back there again and see what is happening at the moment. And I can promise you these dung beetles are so very much skillful because if you check the elephant droppings, they have got quite a lot of things such as these materials. But these kind of beetles are able to separate this kind of strong and hard material and choose the soft. Elephants can be able to eat about 400 kilograms of food a day. And after that, they're only going to digest only 48%. That is why in here, there's still quite a lot of uh, nutrients available. There's even quite a lot of water I can see here. So there's too much water here. You can see now that my stick is showing that uh, this elephant defecated here and urinated as well uh, somewhere in, in here. So I can see that here, the droppings are having quite a lot of moisture. Yeah, so here I can see there's a fight, there's a construction and there's a fight. So this is amazing. Yo, look, there is too much flies here at the moment as we saw them earlier. So these elephants are now starting to concentrate on quite a lot of, uh, they are concentrating on quite a lot of amarulas. I can see that maybe some of these amarulas are now getting some lot of water. They might be now preparing to ripe as normally the amarulas by February is when we are starting to drink the amarula beer. So you can see that now they're trying to push uh, these kind of a very big ball from the ground. Just Let's just see how they are going to manage to get out that kind of a big ball. And they're doing it while fighting at the same time.
You can hear the Cape Turtle Dove is also calling somewhere here nearby, saying, work hard, work hard, work hard, work hard. So dung beetles are so very encouraged by the Cape Turtle Dove here. So you can see they are coming out wet, wet, wet. So dung beetles, they do carry diseases as well. Which mo look at that. <laughs> so you can see that here yeah, there's quite a lot of fighting taking place. So there's different types of dung beetles, and the most interesting one is the one which is called the kleptocoprid. Uh, klepto is just a term which means a thief. There are those who are waiting for the ones who are rolling the balls, come and steal the ball and go away with the ball. They don't want to construct anything. All they want is to take over. Look at that. <laughs> you can see they're lashing each other and they're shoving each other up there. The head is like a spade. So now, uh, let's let's go to Tristan. <laughs> so let's now cross over to Tristan and see some birds. Well, we are indeed on Torchwood at the moment, and we have a beautiful, beautiful bird. In fact, it's one of the most pretty summer birds we get. It's a violet-backed starling. You can see that bright yellow eye ring, and then that plum kind of colour that shimmers in the light and a white chest now that's the male that you're seeing there he's very very pretty and the female is also around somewhere in that area there she is she doesn't look like the same bird at all you can see she's got a streaky little chest and is all brown and drab in coloration in compare comparison to the male but they really are nice birds to see there's a few cape turtle doves that are also sitting on top hello Yes, they look all right. Now, I'm sure Jamie's going to give me trouble about Cape turtle doves because this morning when Seb, myself, and Jamie were driving back from um, Inga's after the morning shift, we um, went past a tree and it looked like a, well, at first looked like a sparrow hawk. So I said, is that a sparrow hawk? And it turned out to be a Cape turtle dove. And then Jamie said she's going to make fun of me. Mm -hmm. So if you hear about it, that's what happened. It's, I'm not ashamed. It's one of those things. It's just the angle that we were at that it looked like that. But anyway, Seb, do you think you can get that wild back starling in the background there now? Because its back has got the kind of light on it. So it's to the back right of where they were. So straight through there to the right a little bit but right 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 no not on that tree it's back quite far back see me on the monitor. so like somewhere there in the background uh, okay. uh, oh i think it might have flown unfortunately sorry buddy that's okay uh, no worries it was just it was catching the light quite nicely so i thought it would be good to have a little look but it was somewhere in that area unfortunately has flown away now the good news is is where we are at the moment we found tracks for both tingana and what looks like tundi it looks like slightly big for Tlalamba. difficult now with the two of them they both have a very similar size track but moving basically up pipeline road um, where we found them this morning is on the other side of this drainage so i think these tracks that we've got are potentially tingana's tracks from this morning before he crossed over but i think the ones from tundi they look like they're on top of his and so maybe she's come back to where Tlalamba was and is going to try and see if she can pick her up so i'm hoping if we loop around we'll be able to get the tracks for both of them and hopefully find both of them which would be quite nice um and hopefully tingana's around would be really good to have a family them once again it's kind of the best way to imagine with Seb on the back you never know these things happen when Seb's on the back so I'm gonna back our luck and hope for the best and see if we get this right I'm, I'm sure we can eventually but their tracks are just on the left hand side here I think it's you'll see them in the sand now that looks like Tundi's track that we've got here at the moment it might be Tingana's I just need to see the size roughly Let's have a look. Um, could very well be Tingana's track that we've got there. It looks like two tracks. Maybe there you can just see it up front and then there's one that's close to the car as well over there. So that looks like Tingana's maybe a little bit big for Tandy, that particular one there. So this is kind of roughly where they've been hanging around, but it's good news for us. Um, anytime there's signs of these guys moving around, it's always good and hopefully it's going to mean that we're going to find them and they'll be somewhere in this area but <laughs> you say leopard whisperer do your thing yes well I, I don't know if i'm going to be doing too much whispering today I, unfortunately i'm not feeling 
very good at all. I'm feeling rather nauseous and have a serious headache. So Seb's going to have to do all the whispering today. Hopefully, I'll get myself sorted during the course of the afternoon and by later we'll get it right. But it's not feeling that good. So we're going to have to try to play a little bit hard. In the meantime, let's send you back across to Jamie, who's still sitting with the little chief. Oh, shame, poor Tristan. He apparently is not feeling very well at all. So I hope he feels better. I hope it's just the heat and nothing else. Uh, it is very, very warm and very sweaty out here. It's quite easy to dehydrate if you're out on safari. Coast, you said something else to me when you were linking to me, but I was distracted because I was talking on the game drive radio at the same time. If it was urgent, please let me know. If not, for the rest of you, I will tell you that you can continue to send through your questions. Ah, oh, good, okay. Chris says it wasn't that important. I sincerely apologize. I was having two conversations and worrying slightly about Trist. I hope he's okay. Now, we have one very sleepy Hosanna. Those of you who've been watching since yesterday's sunset safari, uh, oh, I see, yes, if anyone can whisper leopards out of thin air, Tristan can. Oh, those of you watching will know that Hosanna is injured. He has a nasty wound on his left side, on his left sort of leg there at the join between the leg and the, and the belly, the thigh and the belly. That is a very popular place for injuries on big cats. It seems to be the place that I often see... I'm just thinking, when I look back on injuries I've seen, backs of legs and hips and that area, that join. Now, we've discussed it at length, what we think happened to him. I agree with Tristan. I think it was most likely a warthog. It could also have been the hoof or a horn of an animal that he tried to grab. But I don't, neither of us think that it was a cat. I don't think he was, he had a, a take, a, oh, what's the word? Oh, brain fried. I don't think he had an altercation with Hukumuri or with his dad. I think it was more likely to be something that he was trying to catch. Maybe he got a little overconfident. Could, of course, be a hyena as well. He's... Yeah, boy. But it's... I don't think it's anything to be concerned about. It is something that's sore. I'm sure it's hurting him. It cannot be comfortable. It is deep. But it doesn't go down, it doesn't look to me like it, it's damaged any muscle layers. So it's deep down into the skin and it's exposed the muscle, but it doesn't look as though it's injured him there. Mm -mm. Ali, the resilience of animals, as you know, always it takes us by surprise. Ali wants to know how long I think that wound will take to heal. It depends on infection. Um, and depends, of course, upon whether or not he ends up with a problem like we saw with the Birmingham male years ago, where the, the maggots actually infested that wound. And although they kept it clean, they also stopped it from healing for quite an extended period of time. If the same thing happens to Hosanna, it could actually take a month or two or possibly even more to heal. If it doesn't, uh, you saw how Corky healed up from her, her lion attack wound, the hyena. She was better in three weeks. And I think that Hosanna will probably be the same. I think that's the most likely outcome. I think in three weeks' time, you'll barely be able to see it. There is also a possibility he had a run-in with a lion. But again, I don't think so. I think we would have seen bites, puncture wounds. It, I don't think the injury looks like that. We'll never know, though, exactly what it is that happened to him. Now, Gabrielle wants to know, why do we not give him medical help? Gabrielle, it's a big question and one that we often get asked. First of all, it's not our decision to make. It is not within our power to make that call. It's something that is decided by the overall management of the area that we're in called the Sabi Sand. Now, their policy is one of non-interference unless the injury has been caused by human beings. Now, there are very, very solid reasons for this. It sounds very cold. And a lot of people respond to that by saying, well, you know, we've destroyed these animals' habitat so much. Why is it that we can't give them a helping hand in order to keep them, you know, to, to help them out, given how much we've damaged their population? And it's a fair enough point. 
And there's a lot of room for compassion within conservation, but nature does things best. So nature knows her balance, nature knows what is needed, and nature has her way of not weeding out necessarily the weak, but certainly there are it's a very difficult line to draw. A natural injury like this is going to heal. I don't think Hosanna needs medical intervention. If he was seen with a snare, a metal piece of wire that tightens, that's set out by bushmeat poachers, we would immediately step in. We would immediately call the authorities and they would come in to help us. But by and large, what the approach is here is to let nature run its course. And it has proved itself time and again. A hundred years ago, we decided as human beings, not we personally, because we weren't around a hundred years ago, but it was decided that the best way of conserving the animals in this area was to shoot all the predators because they were eating the, the antelope. And that, meant, that was the conservation norm. That was how people thought they were protecting this area by interfering to that point. Wild dogs, leopards, lions, they all had to go because they were damaging the population of game. Bizarre to us now. Now, as times have moved on, we've moved more in the direction of allowing nature to take her course because interfering causes all sorts of problems. It also costs an immense amount of money, which is obviously well spent in situations where it is human caused, but otherwise is justified more being spent conserving this area as a whole and protecting not one leopard, but every single animal in this entire area. So it is a difficult one and it's one, it's a, it's a concept that a lot of people struggle with and I understand it's human to do so. We want to help, but that level of interference certainly here is not necessary. I'll give you another example because I think, I suspect that you're new to this debate. I'll give you another example with the cubs with mange. The Styx cubs had mange, the Incahuma cubs had mange. There was a lot of a distress that was caused to a lot of people watching the cubs really suffer, and they did suffer. And eventually all eight Styx cubs died. The Incahumas, on the other hand, didn't. Now there is a natural degree of resilience there, obviously. Their genetics somehow helped them out a little bit along the way. It also helped that it did start to rain, of course, as well. But in now, what we've seen is the Nkuhumas, their lions, have been constantly exposed to mange by the Mangeni males who've been spending time with them. And all of those cubs who survived have, been, have not even been affected badly by the mange at all. They've complete, it, it's totally passed them by. Now, if they had been treated, they would not have built up that resilience and immunity. And to make that decision is very, very difficult. Where for me personally, where I start to struggle is not in situations like this. I'm comfortable with letting Hostana heal on his own. Hey, my boy. Yes, I am. It doesn't mean I love you any less. It really doesn't. I do love you. But I love you as a wild animal and as you should be and you be, should be free. Where I start to struggle is where an animal is clearly at the point of suffering and they're going to die and I struggle with not being able to step in to end that suffering. Then again, there have been cases where I've watched an animal suffering convinced that it's going to die and it's recovered on its own. So, you know, it's a very, very difficult line to draw. And no one can shout anyone down for not having, or for having that compassion, but it's a question of really thinking about it a little bit more clearly and with a bit of, well, a bit of healthy dose of reality, I guess, unfortunately. And I say that without being cruel. The truth is nature does things better. It's extraordinary also how people, it's, and I find it particularly with hyenas, how people often step in when they see an injured leopard or a lion and they go, we must treat it. And then the, something like a hyena walks past with two broken back legs and continues on without the same outcry. Human beings by nature, myself included, can be very hypocritical. You'll be fine. I'm not worried. We'll keep a close eye on it. We'll watch for signs of infection. The flies are all sitting on it, which I think is why he's so restless. 
Lie on it, my boy. Lie on it. Put it down in the cold dirt. That will help. So while Hosanna lies down in his preferred spot for the moment, let's go to lying lions in the Maasai Mara. Righty, here we have found, you can see an astonishing lion sighting here. Now what these lions are doing is lying in ambush, waiting for the elephants. They're almost certainly going to kill one of the elephants and have it for supper. As you can see, their strategy is perfect. The elephants are coming slowly closer towards them. And have flattened themselves into the grass in order to uh, create the ambush situation. The little one there that's flicking its tail up and down is uh, sort of trying to attract the curiosity of the elephant so they'll come here a little bit faster. I'm obviously talking utter garbage. This is the sausage tree pride. It is not all of them. We think it's three cubs and three adult lionesses. In fact, that's definitely what it is. And so we're missing two lionesses, which is very exciting. Probably not far from here, in the stream or brook that we have sort of running past this area, and possibly with new tiny baby little cubbies. But we're gonna hang around here because this is obviously the most bankable sighting for our TV show later on today. And hopefully these cats will get up and do something other than what they're doing now, especially that they have the little ones with them. I don't think the elephants know that the lions are here at all. I think that the lions may be forced to move as a result of the elephants. I'll be quite grateful to the elephants if that is the case. Very little sound, just a very upset, I think it's probably a cicada species going tick, 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 tick in the background. No, see, now, a big male lion could never kill an elephant unless the elephant was on its very last legs. Uh, a big male elephant, of course, weighs five tons. A big male lion weighs 200 kilograms. And so the size difference is, is well, it's phenomenal, really. Uh, what is it? It's five, 25 times the size. And a big male lion might be able to ride on the back of an elephant, but you certainly couldn't kill it. You do hear stories of elephants being killed by lions, often in drought conditions in places like Savuti in Botswana, but it is very uncommon. Uh, well, it's not that uncommon, I suppose, in the dry season with young elephants, but it's very uncommon that it would ever be an adult elephant. Once an elephant gets past sort of 10 years old, really, unless it's very sick, it's going to be tough for a pride of lions or an enormous clan of hyenas to take it down. Now the little cubs are watching, enjoying this game viewing experience in the Mara. Their neighbors, who I'm sure fill them with a sense of curiosity and also not a little fear. That's so sweet. Isn't that wonderful? It's a lovely picture. <laughs> you can see the adults are not vaguely concerned. Haven't even bothered to lift their heads. Oh, there comes a head. I predict it'll go straight down again. Mm -hmm. yeah. But of course for the little ones who haven't seen too many elephants in their short time here on planet Earth, this is all very exciting. As is chewing the bush in front of you. <laughs> Alrighty, I'm going to wait and see what happens here. We're going to go back across to Hosanna now. I believe he's a bit thirsty. All right. 
Right, well, James sees what happens there. We are sitting with the lovely Hosanna, who's decided to quench his thirst. I suspect, judging from his behavior today, I think that that wound is very sore today. I think that it's quite sore. I think it's making him hot. I think it might be a little bit infected. I haven't seen it properly to really confirm that, though, because it took me a while to get around to where he is at the moment, drinking from a truly fetid looking water source. If I'm quiet, you can just hear him lapping, I think, maybe over the sounds of the birds. Maybe not. Very thirsty boy, though. Well, as long as he keeps eating, keeps drinking, he can walk, he's not limping. He's not limping too badly, so I think it won't affect his ability to hunt. It's very beautiful down here, it really is. And although summer has made our lives more difficult in terms of finding animals, certainly, spotting them in the thick vegetation or even just trying to track them it does mean that everything is that much more beautiful to look at the gold of a leopard contrasting about the verdant against the verdant green to use james's word is truly spectacular scoop says that hosana is hunting tadpoles right now yes a little source of protein maybe just a little pick me up Imagine how scary it must be for the tadpoles, because they do like to hang about the edges of these pools, somewhere relatively shadow, where they can look up, especially in dirty water, where they can perhaps see whatever they're after, mosquito larvae or whatever it happens to be. I'm sure there was one little tadpole that went, swim away, and they all went dashing off. Lily says that he is very thirsty. He is. I can't blame him. I have to say I'm very thirsty too. And I've just realized I've finished my entire bottle of water. And it's only, phew, what time is it? It's only just after five, which means we've still got another two and a half hours to go. I'm going to need to start carrying five liter water bottles. It is, it's a thirsty kind of a day. It's definitely a lot of humidity in the air. There's another storm building up over the mountains that isn't going to get to us. I've given up thinking it's going to rain for now. So yes, he's thirsty. I think, I think he's very restless, honestly. I think he's sore. It must be very painful. That injury there is constantly moving, uh, or an area that he's constantly moving will also mean that its rate of healing is going to be slightly slower. It's not as though an animal can go and rest a wild animal like this. He can't be put to bed with a thermometer in his mouth and a bandage around his wounds. Oh, he's lying in the watery mud now, trying to cool down. Those of you who've experienced high temperatures, as in, in terms of internal body temperature, when you've had a fever, you'll know what this feels like when you've got a fever and it's hot outside. It's just the absolute worst. Which is why I was eternally grateful when I had malaria that we had aircon in the bedroom. It just made such a difference to my recovery and it made me think of all those poor people who get malaria regularly in Africa who don't. Don't have access to the medication or a fan or anything to help to keep them cool. It's horrible being ill and it being boiling hot outside. Lots of flies about down here. Osana, it's much cooler up out of this drainage line, I have to tell you. It really is. There's, there's a breeze. You're not going to take my advice because he doesn't understand. Remember a year ago? When Hosanna, it was, it was about a year ago, it was when he fell out of a tree and he developed a limp and we were all terribly, con well, 
We're vaguely concerned about him. Not too worried, just a little bit. Okay, well, we sit to make sure the little chief doesn't vanish on us before the TV show. Let's go across to James, who has found himself some elephants. I thought there may be a little bit of a roar there. That's why I was silent for a second. Anyway, it was just a yawn. As you can see, the inexorable hunt is underway. The elephants are walking into the ambush, and the lions have perked up slightly. There we go. I think I can hear Kirsten talking, but I... Is she talking to us? No, general comms. Okay. Sorry about that, everybody. We've got two radios on the on the car. I thought maybe that my radio had malfunctioned, but well, it hasn't. Now, if you look to the right there, I think that elephant, the little one on the left of the right-hand herd, lifted its trunk up and maybe spotted the lions. Tell me, yes, elephants would kill lion cubs if lion cubs didn't move out the way. They wouldn't go out of their way to kill them in the same way that a buffalo would. But certainly, the elephants would be a danger to them, more to the adults, but also to the cubs. Now we're getting a little bit of play behavior, which is nice. There's a bit of cuddling going on to the left of that bungay. There we go. A bit of fun lion cuddling. They do like to cuddle, do lions? Just like my mother's cat. <laughs> they are so adorable when they do that. And who will ever forget the sighting of Jamie Patterson, Amber Eyes, and one of Amber Eyes's uh, nephews or nieces, and Amber Eyes hugging it. Yes, JW, I am absolutely being completely sarcastic about this ambush. This is not an ambush. This is just a coincidental meeting of two species. The elephants happened to be grazing up the hill. The lions, on a hot day, were lying under the only tree that was convenient to them. And now they're going to have a meeting. Which will consist of the lions getting up and loping off somewhere else, and the elephants walking past. Now you can see... I'd say they're probably about 70 meters away or so. And the lions on the right have now perked up. They're quite interested. Excuse me, just scratching my head there. To be brutally honest, I was taking my hat off so that I could have a sip of tea. I thought I can't lie to you. We know each other. We know each other well enough now for me to tell you that I'm having some tea as I watch this wonderful sighting. What a way to spend a Sunday afternoon. Elephants, the Olololo escarpment in the background, the smell of a wood fire, which I hope will go out fairly soon, the sun about to set, the sausage tree pride and their cubs having a bit of a cuddle and a play and a cup of Kenyan tea in my hand. <laughs> and they call this work. I've got to be very careful not to slurp my tea because Kirsten finds it very un unpleasant. Michelle, I normally agree that coffee is better, but at this time of the afternoon, tea is what you want. Ideally with a cream scone. We don't have cream scones, we do have some superbly roasted nuts. And so I've had a couple of nuts and my tea. Christmas cake would also be wonderful, actually. Mm. There's something also tremendously comforting about the smell of a wood fire, even if it is a one that seems to be slightly wild up on the hill. Nola, you have your Earl Grey. I'm having normal 
tea grown here in Kenya. Ceylon tea, I suppose you'd call it. I do like a bit of Earl Grey. This is just, I mean, it's just going to slowly get better and better. I'm sure many of you sitting there are thinking jealously of my position here. Yeah, I was saying this yesterday and I really do believe it that... Oh, she's got a collar on. I didn't see that. Sorry about that. She's obviously being monitored quite carefully. Doesn't look particularly comfortable, does it? Anyway, I'm sure she's used to it by now. Um, I was saying yesterday that I, I must constantly be aware that, you know, you obviously, whatever job you do, you get tired from time to time. But this particular job, I do need to constantly remind myself of how unspeakably lucky I am to call what I'm doing right now work. I think back to my days as a guitar teacher uh, back in Johannesburg and uh, what I used to do on Sunday afternoons there and as the growing dread for the week started to build and I don't feel that at all anymore just very special indeed biologically there's not a huge amount of interesting thing or stuff going on here these elephants will probably spot the lions eventually their eyes are not fantastic. I don't think they're as bad as a lot of people will have, you, will have you believe. If the elephants become aware of the lions, one or two might take a few steps towards them. If they stay at this distance and kind of graze around, I suspect that we're actually inadvertently protecting the lions from the elephants because we're parked directly behind them. I don't think that's going to affect <coughs> the outcome tremendously, except that it might allow the lions to lie here for a bit longer, because the elephants are going to avoid walking straight at us. But other than that, everything is very calm and peaceful here, and in fact you can see the lions settling in again. They won't be particularly worried about the situation because, of course, they know they are much faster than elephants. And I suspect also they realise that despite the fact that in a, an outright sprint, an adult elephant could probably outrun one of these cubs, they know that the elephants will probably not push home and attack if they back off fast enough. There's the same probably wouldn't be said for a herd of buffalo coming this way. Birds are just starting now to make their evening calls down in the brook below us, in the thick trees. Umka, sorry, I missed that. Was it how far can elephants feed? In a day, in an area like this, I don't think they move tremendously far, but it's probably a good five or six kilometers, I suppose. Oh, how far can they see? Uh, well, there we go. That, that elephant's now spotted a lion. There we go. And that's at a distance of about 50 metres. Look at them. She's, she's told all the rest. She's infrasonically told all the others that, they're a pride of, that there's a pride of lions here. They're now all completely alert. Look at that. Only one elephant saw these cats, and they all reacted straight away, the elephants did. and they're moving away. That's really very interesting. I've seen elephants do exactly the opposite of this and chase the lions away, but maybe because we're here, they decided not to do that. So, Umkar, I don't know, I mean, look, I don't know what distance they're able to see accurately at, but, you know, I think it depends on what sort of um, terrain they're in, so could they see me Walking across an open plain at 100 meters? Yes, definitely they could, absolutely. That's at 330 feet. Could they see me, or could I 
successfully walk through some thick bush in front of them at 100 meters. If I didn't make a noise, yes, I probably could. They probably wouldn't pick me up then. They do apparently also have a blind spot. And if you approach them straight side on and they're feeding, they won't see you. Now, I've never tried that myself. I've read about it from a very reliable source. But um, I wouldn't try that. Now they're running. I mean, that bunch is totally taking off. That's why I think that what frightened those elephants yesterday morning, remember we had that long line of elephants running with the matriarch standing at the back shimmying them along. I think that they must have seen a predator. Now they've stopped. Look, they've all stopped at the same time. Someone's told them to stop. Somebody said, hang on, wait. Now probably all start moving as one again. There we go. All of that is being communicated most likely with infrasound. Brings up two questions here. The first one is, why is it that they should be afraid of these lions? There is no real reason for them to be afraid. Yes, they are trying to protect their youngsters. And in theory, I suppose three lionesses, they don't know how many lionesses there are here, could take down a very small one. But they should know by now that they're not going to try and take down a small one in amongst a group, big group of adults. And it must have something to do with their ancient past. There's something in their biology or something in prehistory that has made them this reactive to predators. And I can only think it must have been an experience or, or you know, a millennia of experience with big saber-toothed cats, much bigger predators than these lions, who posed a genuine threat to elephants and their babies, who were able to spook the herd, make them run, and then take one out. Because they react in much the same way to wild dogs even, and there's no way a wild dog's ever going to take down an elephant. Stunning little sighting, that. Really lovely, and the light is now coming out. Tea is finished, in case you were wondering. Valka dog, you say that was incredible to watch. Yes, it was marvelous to watch. Very special. Now, Bungay, do you want some light on these lions or do you want them backlit? On. Okay, let's move just slightly forward and then we'll get a better look at the lions. Are you pleased with that? I'll drive gently so the nuts don't go all over the place. And in fact, while I do that, uh, we're going to go across to Sidders for a small update. I have just left the dung beetles uh, not long time ago, and now I am heading much more towards the Chitwa Chitwa to go and see if we cannot find any of the interesting animals that side. So there's just elephant tracks everywhere. So those are the tracks I have seen here since I have spoken of the game reserves. And these elephants, the tracks are heading much more towards the very same direction. Maybe we might be lucky much more that side and see the biggest animal. So this area here where we are, this is the fire break. Is the area we saw. <laughs> they attack while being in the bush. I haven't been attacked, but I have been charged. I have been charged not once, not twice. 
Something very important about working in the bush is that you must always expect unexpected because animals can easily hide behind the bushes and before you see them, they see you. So which means I can be walking now, trying to approach an animal which is there while not seeing another animal which is somewhere much closer. So those kind of challenges, they do happen while we are doing some operations here in the wild. So I just want to show you the area we have been seeing a lot earlier by the end of last year. This was the fire break, the fire break which was open. Now look at the recovery. This bush is recovering. There's only a little bit of uh, bare patches. At the moment, you can see that the grasses are coming back heavily. And when the grasses are starting to get excited like this, it gives us, as conservists, a big sign that this year, possibilities of having heavy fires in different areas are high because too much rain grows grasses and too much grasses then becomes a lot of fuel, which will then facilitate a lot of fires during the fire season. So it's good to have rains, but rains at the same time, they do bring us a lot of grasses and fires can only get excited by the heavy fuel. So it means in, uh, in order to predict the amount of fuel you are going to have by next year, now when the rain is still growing and the recovery is happening, is when you can tell. So the bush, it does go through different kind of assessments. These animals, when you are seeing them here feeding every day, there's something which is called field condition assessment. The bush has to be assessed in order to see if it can still capacitate the animals who are feeding on them. So that is done through a process called the felt condition assessment where we check the key on this process is the grasses. We check how many grazers and all these different kind of browsers. So now let's uh, cross over uh, to uh, James. Our son is still enjoying this little, not quite wallow that he's found himself, but we were talking earlier about water and why he doesn't just go and lie in the water. He isn't lying in the water, but he's found himself the next best thing. He's found himself some mud that's not, it's not waterlogged, so it's not sticking to him or he's not sinking into it, but it's just enough to cool him down ever so slightly. He was briefly interested in something rustling in the, the pile of dried up dead tree behind him. Looks like it was a knobthorn at one point in its life. It is now no longer. So something was in there, and it was obviously making a bit of noise. So he went to go and try and stick his head in there, and then fortunately thought better of it, because I think that probably would have resulted potentially in the loss of an eye, or an eye injury, which I don't think he needs to add to his list of woes. I'm sure you will all agree. Hey, boy. See how restless he is. He's been like this all afternoon, up, down, up, down, up, down. Nice, cool spot. I'm sure he's got a temperature. I reckon if you were able to st hold him still for long enough and take his temperature, it would be a few points of a degree over what it should be. Child of the Universe wants to know how you avoid dehydration in such heat. Now, us as humans, well, obviously we've got a, a degree of control over how we go about this whole process. We do a lot of sweating, a lot more sweating than most animals. So we do lose a lot of water and the way that we cope with that is obviously just rehydrating constantly. And if anyone shows any signs similar to what Tristan's been dealing with today, then what we'll usually do is try and give a little bit of rehydrate as well, just to replenish so the, the salt balance within the body. Because obviously drinking water is all fine and well, and for most of us it's usually fine. It's enough combined with a bit of food to keep us well balanced. As long as you drink, you have to drink a lot. But you'll find that you do automatically. You find that you just drink double, triple the amount that you would if it was, say, a average 75 degree Fahrenheit day. You're just automatically drinking all the time if you can. And then obviously staying cool if possible. A lot of people are adapted quite well 
to dealing with heat out here because we live out here. You'll find that someone who isn't often will, will struggle a little bit in the beginning. But for those of us that are familiar with it, it's, it's not too unbearable. You just have to keep drinking water and on and on until you, you, you make sure that you don't dehydrate. For the animals, obviously, there's lots of water around at the moment. Fortunately, out here, high temperatures coincide with the rainy season, which means that there is water available for them to drink. So they will drink more than normal. There are certain animals, of course, that are adapted to replenish the water that they lose, or sorry, not to replenish the water that they lose, to minimize the amount of water that they use. For example, the, the feedback system within an oryx, which allows them to cool the blood before it goes to the part of their brain that is receptive to temperature, internal temperature, so that it actually tricks the brain into thinking the animal is not as hot as it is. And at the same time, also it means that the brain doesn't overheat or get too hot. That's basically a, you know, it's it, where blood flows one way up against cold blood flow and helps to keep it cool before it goes to the brain. I can't think of the word I'm looking for. <laughs> Child of the universe says that they're drinking more water just watching us. I know, you gotta keep drinking, stay hydrated folks. I was going to make a sarcastic comment, but I'm going to hold back. Stay hydrated. No tea and coffee on a day like today, lest you find yourself dehydrating yourself even further. Shame, my boy, it's sore. Hey, every time he settles, then I think the flies land in it, and it's just really, really uncomfortable for him. Oh, pity. Shame. Very South African thing to say shame for this because I'm feeling sorry for him. Oh, we're busy feeling sorry for ourselves in this heat. James is absolutely right. Whenever we think of it as a job, we have to remind ourselves how lucky it is that we are to be in this job. And that means taking in the sunset. So we've moved slightly, and you can see we are now facing, well, southwest. And that's where the sun is going down behind the escarpment shortly. And in front of the tree that Bungay insisted I park behind, or you can see the lions. Well, you will be able to see them as the camera slowly exposes for the ground. Beautiful. It's an interesting thing, that staying hydrated discussion that you're having, because... One of the greatest misconceptions about dehydration and about heat stroke exhaustion is that the more water you drink, the safer you will be. And that is not in fact true because you lose a huge amount of salt if you sweat a great deal. And drinking too much water can result in renal failure and another condition which whose name I might naturally have forgotten because of a lack of salt and that can be potentially fatal and is actually much more dangerous than a little bit of dehydration and in fact it's the greatest cause of medical emergencies in marathon running so you have you know you have these me medical tents at the end of marathons and very seldom do people rush into the tent in a state of dehydration they run in because they've drunk too much and the salts in their bodies have diluted so much that their organs start to shut down. So you've got to balance the amount of water you drink and increase it with a little bit of salt. These chaps have no such worry, of course, because it is beautifully cool here. I'd say the temperature is probably now about 25 degrees Celsius, 75 Fahrenheit. There isn't a breath of wind. That will change. As the sun goes down, I'm pretty sure we'll get a slight northerly breeze as the sun goes down. I mean, that is just too cute. Isn't it lovely? Still suckling. For those of you who are not familiar with these lions, if you have perhaps just joined us, I'm very 
would be very happy to welcome you if you have just joined us. It would be lo lovely to know if you are watching for the first time. This is the Sausage Tree Pride. It consists of five females, three, three cubs, and we suspect uh, at least one more litter of small cubs that have yet to be introduced to the Pride. All three of these cubs are male. Two of them are five months old, plus minus. The other is four months old, plus minus. They are well, they're fall under the ambit of the Aldonio Payek males. Two males who we examined in great detail yesterday from behind. And between them, they appear to only have one testicle, which I think is quite, uh, well, very sad for them, but very interesting from the point of view of how they're going to leave some sort of genetic legacy. Here is Kinky Tail. Hello, Michelle. You say you're here for the first time. Allow me to introduce you to Kinky Tail, the most famous lioness of the Sausage Tree Pride. She is about to pop. Look how heavy her belly is. She hasn't given birth yet. You can see her nipples are very swollen, but they are, definitely don't have any suckle marks on them. I'm actually quite surprised that these youngsters haven't tried to suckle off her, despite the fact that she hasn't given birth yet. I must also say, for those of you who have been watching for a while, there's no question that I was wrong when I was here last. I know, I know it's impossible to believe, but it's true. I was wrong when I was here last because I said that one of the lionesses was definitely going to give birth uh, very soon, and I think she was actually just full. I'm pretty sure that she was pregnant, but she didn't give birth with the three weeks that I thought she was going to. Um, Bunga, can we have a look at that rather interesting pose that the lioness under the tree has has struck as she watches the sunset? I think that is very special. Many of you shocked that Kinky Tail is still pregnant. I know it is shocking, isn't it? But it won't be for long. She's going to give birth shortly. Be a magic to catch that on camera, wouldn't it? Magic Dragon Wizard, given that you are the magical one, I, I don't know that I'm qualified to answer this better than you can. You say, how many cubs do I think that she has in there? I don't know. I mean, the average for lions is somewhere between three and six, so around about four, I guess. Um, I've never seen a litter of five, though. I mean, all six. So I'm going to say three or four in there. Maybe it's bigger. I doubt it, though. She also doesn't look like she ate a great deal yesterday of that buffalo, and I suspect that's because it's just too deeply uncomfortable. I must say, every time I see a heavily pregnant female anything, I am, again, grateful for the Y chromosome that I was blessed with. I will never have to endure pregnancy. I suppose, for those of you who are mothers, it must come with its advantages. But I have enormous respect for any female mammal who has to carry youngsters to term, especially out here where there is no sympathy for the pregnant. There's certainly no molly coddling by the time birth takes place, except amongst the elephants, interestingly. So these lions, I mean, she'll have to take herself off and give birth on her own without any kind of help. No one will be around her to give her any kind of assistance. And the elephants, birth is almost celebrated. It's very sweet. The rest of the herd will surround the elephant herd or the elephant mother, and watch her give birth and protect her and look after her. Magic Dragon Wizard, you say three cubs. Well, that's very good. I'm glad you were able to tell through whatever bowl or crystal ball you were looking in. And she has three cubs. It is a perfect afternoon. So those are the two mothers the soon-to-be mother, we think another one of them 
Well, Isaac certainly thinks that she's got cubs down below in the brook below us. Brook, stream, gully, lugger, small river, whatever you like to call it. I think he's probably right. Otherwise, I think they'd probably all be here. And in case you weren't watching yesterday, they are, of course, still fat, full and satisfied after the buffalo they ate. That hugging is just too sweet. We got here at exactly the right time, everyone. We had hardly any flat cat. It's not too hot, and so they've got a little bit more active than one would expect, perhaps, at this time of the day. <laughs> and now you can hear them. satisfied grunting and groaning. And it really is too magic, this scene. I can't imagine a more magical type of a scene, really, for a Sunday afternoon. With a cup of tea in my hand. Of course, by the time the TV show comes along, what they'll all be doing is lying as flat as humanly, as leonine possible in the grass. And we'll get one ear flicking for the duration. I hope that isn't the case. <laughs> and as is exactly the same with my nephews, everyone plays nicely for a while until somebody gets a little bit rough with someone else, and then there are tears. We're not moving anywhere from this magical scene. Let's go back to Tristan Dix, the leopard whisperer. Hoped his whispering succeeds. Well, I'm sure not, Jane. Sounds absolutely magical between the golden light and the little playful cubs. It's about as good as one could ever ask for. And it's something about that light that you get in the Mara that really kind of um, is very, very special. Now, we've had. But can I be described as a bit of a frustrating afternoon? We've got tracks for Tlalamba, alarm calls of guinea fowls, found the guinea fowls up in the tree, which is normally a surefire sign that a leopard has just walked there. Can't find them anywhere and got no signal in those areas. We've now tracking Tingana, which are fresh tracks because I found where he was and the grass that he was sleeping on hasn't even stood up yet. It's still flat on the ground completely, um, and the tracks look pretty good, but I just can't... He kind of cut into a block, and I haven't found anything coming out yet, and it's why I'm going so slowly at the moment, because I'm trying to see if he comes out onto this road. He was coming from my right side towards this kind of area, and there was some warthogs. What do you see, sir? You see a raptor? Okay. Come on, Rusty. Rusty's gears are not doing well. It looks like a Wahlberg's eagle that we've got in the tree itself. And let's have a look. Just double check quickly. Yes, pale form Wahlbergs that are sitting there. Nice long rectangular tail, little crest, and it's being dive bombed, as you can see by those forked tail drongos. So the drongos are having a bit of a go at them. And it's actually sometimes worth finding a raptor like this and just sitting and listening. So we spent a bit of time on First Rock itself because Tingana, where we found him where he was lying, was just below First Rock. We found a little tree that he had been underneath for probably the majority of today. Um, and 
you know, that's a great area just to stop and listen for any sounds or any alarm calls or anything like that. And we haven't heard too much. So I think wherever he may be, he's either lying down again and is sleeping underneath a tree somewhere or he is... Uh, moved quite far out of this area but i don't think so like i say that that place where he was lying the grass has definitely stood up which i mean which is definitely still flattened and normally once the pressure is lifted the grass will slowly start to come back up again and kind of stand and will show that he's kind of been a long time since he was there so i'm hoping he's not too far away we'll just keep scratching the good thing is, is he looks like he's walking back towards juma which will help our signal for this evening if we can find him but that walberg's eagle is taking it very easy the other problem that we've got is the clouds are coming in now and the wind has dropped and it's starting to get rather warm once again. Anyway, we're going to keep looking. We're going to try our very best to find this cat before the end of drive. In the meantime, let's send you back across to James and the beautiful sunset and lines. It's starting to get a bit warm. Sounds like it's been warm for weeks there, it's Juma. Well, the consistency of the Mara weather has been an utter joy for us over here. Good luck, Tristan. I do wish you the very best of luck. You've got 45 minutes until TV starts. All the best. I must say, there's a rising panic when you've been out for three hours already, TV starting in half an hour, and you've got one grasshopper to show for your efforts. It's a, it's, it's not an easy thing to deal with emotionally. <laughs> I have often experienced it. Right, we're now going to attempt sunset two. Bungay, remember yesterday I filmed you an epic sunset. We're trying to do the same again today. Bungay, I will just warn you and tell you that the sequ sequel is often not as good as the first movie. But let's see if you can do it here. Wayne, the TV show is going to be live from South Africa today on SABC3 at 6.30 p.m. at 7.30 p.m. East African time. It'll be me and Sydney and Jamie and Tristan and whatever animals we can find. All right, let's be quiet for 20 seconds and just appreciate this amazing scene. I 
does feel like they have come to appreciate it in much the same way. Thomas, you say you appreciate the silence. Yeah, it's such a rare thing in our lives, isn't it? And as I say that, there's a jet flying over the top of us. And I suppose it's a wonderful sort of indication of why our lives are so seldom silent. Technology has made them pretty noisy. Of course, the bush is not ever really silent, but it feels silent because the noises are all natural. How the sun's gone down, the reverence with which they've watched it is over. The evening will continue for these predominantly nocturnal creatures. Costa lions do go to quiet places to deliver their babies. They'll probably go down into, like I say, a secluded spot where there's a cave or an overhang or something that they can hide their cubs in in order to make sure that they are safe and not, you know, put under, or not, not easily found by potential predators. There we go dinner time now. The sun's entertainment is over. Right, well, I'm not sure how reverently Hosanna is watching the heat of the low felt summer. Let's go and see. I'm not sure that Hassan is enjoying the heat of the low felt very much this afternoon. I am. I don't mind heat too much. I really would prefer to be too hot than too cold. It is warm though. And I am considerably sweaty and it's going to be an interesting TV show because I'm going to be a bit sort of, well, clearly perspiring, let's put it that way. <laughs> not going to be at, at our sort of best. We're going to be a bit bedraggled, all of us. Hassan is fine. Steve mentioned an injury on his right side as well. I haven't seen anything yet. Rosemary, you want to know how hot it is at night on Juma? I would say that it sits probably around about between 25 to 30 degrees, depending on the day we had and if we've had wind. Last night was actually quite nice because after the hot day, the wind blew in quite strongly. And that helped to take the temperature down a little bit to probably around about... I think we would have started this morning at around 25, 26. So mid 70s Fahrenheit. It's not, it's nothing like, when was it? 2016? Was it 2000? Yes, it was. It was 2016 when we, we were absolutely baking hot. We really were. I'm completely perplexed. I now cannot remember 2016 at all. Okay, I don't know. The passage of time is confusing me. Quick, off you go across to Tristan, who found, well, something with spots. Well, Jamie, and 2016 was horrendous in terms of heat. But interestingly enough, we have Aina with suckle marks on Torchwood. That is right where we're looking for Tingana. You can see, look, the soil and belly there with milk. So all of you that know how to identify all of these hyenas, maybe a good time to look. And this hyena's got its nose in the air. I wonder if Tingana is not somewhere here. Might be worth following this hyena. This is the exact direction that the tracks came in. And the way that this hyena is walking around, it's got its nose up and is smelling. But I want to know who it is. I, I mean, I think it could be June that we're seeing. Um, and what she's doing in Torchwood, I'm not quite sure. The ears look pretty good and intact, which is a, a feature of June. So I want to just try and see if I can kind of see where she goes. If we can just kind of keep parallel with her as she's walking along. I don't necessarily want to sort of off-road too far, but that's the exact kind of route I would have expected Tingana to take. I unfortunately haven't seen him um, in this area, but I know where she's going. So let's just try and get back around. 
But the last time we followed a hyena, we were successful in that we found Hosanna. And the way that she's got her nose down to the ground, it almost looks as though she can sniff out something that potentially we can't. So I'm just going to quickly get in line. There we go. You see now she's turned and come back our way, which means I have a funny feeling he's walked this direction already and I've just missed his track crossing this road. It's a bit tricky on this road to see tracks nicely, but the way that she's kind of nose down sniffing, that's how hyenas do it when they follow leopards, is that they get their nose to the ground and then they end up kind of sniffing about. You see that? See how she's kind of a very different posture to what she had just now. She's working out, hang on, where did this leopard go? And they do this regularly because they know often leopard might lead them to food. And so they will actively track leopard like we will in order to try and figure out where they are. And he, she might lead us straight to him if we're lucky. But you see that milk there. You can see it heavily um, on her tummy. Um, and those ears are pretty perfect, which means that it's definitely not corky or pretty. So who are you and where are your cubs? Because that is heavy, heavy milk that she's got there. I'm just trying to see, is it Juna? Looks, there's that nice kind of circle on his shoulder. So it might very well be her, but you see how she's smelling. I think she can pick up the scent of Tingana, which is good news for us. Like I say, if we just patient and maybe follow her through, we might actually be able to find our leopard as well. So we're going to use an animal this time as a tracker and see how it goes. The way that she's got her nose to the ground is positive for us because she's not following my scent. She's most definitely following the scent of potentially where Tingana has walked. So we're just gonna turn around and see where she goes. It's gotten very, very humid all of a sudden. So Giraffe Girl, you reckon it is June? So June, where are you keeping your babies? If you are milling about in the middle of Torchwood, I'm curious now if maybe her den isn't on Torchwood somewhere. Um, the way that she's milling about here is at this time of the day in this heat, I can't expect her den to be too far away. Um, I suppose she might not have gone back to the, the little cubs this morning. So it's potentially that, you know, they're not around, but that hyena is on the march. It starts it's nose down and is sniffing everywhere amazing the senses these animals have right so before we lose it let's catch up there so june is exciting and there's definitely cubs somewhere that amount of milk is being produced it's got to be that she has cubs somewhere good we're going to keep following maybe she'll take us back to the cubs maybe she'll take us to tingana who knows either way it'll be interesting let's send you back across though to james in the meantime as he still sits with his lions it's very exciting this would be june's first litter i imagine she's got cubs i hope that she's den somewhere on juma or torchwood the lions here continue to play which fills me with a great sense of dread because my great fear, of course, is that they're going to be fast asleep come half past six or half past seven East African time. <laughs> Imagine having your head inside that lioness's mouth. I wouldn't like that. Isn't it interesting how all animals have this knowledge somehow of what constitutes gentle play behavior versus actual aggression, how they understand what will cause pain and what won't to a large extent. And playing with a dog is a wonderful example of doing that. We have a dog in Kenton where I spend a lot of my time. My father's dog, whose name is Fenton, and Fenton is amazingly good at not biting my hand off, which is very kind of him. And he's a, got very powerful jaws, but he knows when he's playing and he doesn't ever break the skin. Well, he sometimes does, but that's by mistake. And I'm amazed that animals know how to do that. And I mean, if you look at these lions, they obviously know precisely what's too hard and what's gentle enough with their cubs. Can we have a look at the fire there, Pongo, if you don't mind? You can actually see the flames now. I don't think anything is 
in danger there. I don't think there's a huge amount to burn, simply because the grass is pretty green. But it's a bigger fire than I thought it was. I'm pretty sure it'll go out in the night. It's not moving at any great speed. But it seems to have be radiating out from a central point. In fact, it's exactly what it's doing. It's radiating in a circle. So it was set in one spot and it's burning out from there. All right, everybody, that's going to be it from this end of the safari. We'll see you tomorrow if you're not going to join us for the SABC show. And we'll see you tomorrow at 5 o'clock Central African time. That's 6 o'clock East African time. Thank you very much for your questions and your comments. As always, they are much appreciated, especially for those of you who spoke to us for the very first time. Until tomorrow, thank you and bye-bye.